Thank you all for joining us for CCI Institute's 2020 economic update for commercial real estate professionals featuring Casey Conway and Eddie Blanton. We're very thrilled to have you all participate here. This is the latest in a series of resources that CCM Institute is providing to help commercial real estate professionals to work the problem and find new opportunities amid the COVID-19 pandemic. It's now my absolute pleasure to introduce 2020 CCIM Institute President Eddie Blanton. Eddie? Hi, I'm Eddie Blanton, 2020 President for CCIM Institute. Today's session is brought to you by 10X. Before our session begins, please, please welcome Ian Grudz, Senior Director for 10X Commercial. Thanks so much, Eddie. 10X greatly values the CCIM collaboration and is proud to be a national conference sponsor going on five years, as well as supporting the initiatives of many local chapters. I received my designation more than 20 years ago and proud to have served as chapter president of CCIM New York and currently as the national chair of marketing. My first encounter with 10X was on the brokerage advisory side on behalf of a corporate client who requested that I sell a property through live bid auction. Having experienced the power of the platform firsthand with the tremendous broker resources and a process that greatly increases getting deals closed were reasons I joined the company four years ago. Every property on our platform requires a listing broker, and we have worked with CCIMs throughout the country. I'm excited to share our new broker partnership program and introduce my colleague, Jim Palmer, Senior Vice President, Broker Strategy. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so 10X is formerly known as auction.com, and with these uncertain market conditions, it feels a whole lot like 2009 all over again when we built our business on helping motivated sellers dispose of their assets through an online auction process. Here we are 10 years later with $23 billion sold on the platform, a database of 400,000 investors and far better marketing and technology tools for brokers to leverage today. We have, we have auction events every two weeks, which has continued through the pandemic and our clients have been asking us what we're seeing. So we're putting out relevant data and market color the best we have at the moment, being transparent on what we're seeing and hearing. And in our auction last week, we again saw really positive traction on a number of deals with very active bidding wars, many of which had eight, nine, 10 unique bidders bidding on smaller balance assets up to an $11 million office building in Illinois. The middle market space remains relatively strong from our lens. I'm sure Casey, will, he'll be providing a, a much more comprehensive market update than, than I can, but thought it would be good to share you know, what we're seeing for, uh, from our perspective, at least on our platform. So some, some noteworthy stats from our most recent auction uh, two weeks ago, eight fully approved bidders on every, uh, on average per asset, 36 unique bids on average per asset. Our trade rate was 68%. Assets range from $800,000 up to that $10.6 million uh, office building in Illinois. And then 42% of buyers from out of, were, were from out of the state of that property. We have definitely seen sellers more willing to flex and, and meet the market, which has been certainly positive from our perspective. Um, there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of buyers on the sidelines right now with cash to deploy, and we're really not seeing a dip in activity, and, and it's been encouraging to continue to see real estate trade through, through these crazy times. Um, what Ian referenced before and what I'm really excited to share with you all today is the new broker partnership program that we just rolled out to reward brokers for bringing opportunities to the platform. As you may or may not know, 10X gets paid a buyer's premium from the buyer at closing. So for brokers that are part of this program, we're offering to share a percentage of our fee with you or your seller. You have the choice to receive the fee share at closing to be paid to either your brokerage firm or you can pass it on to the seller. Most brokers that we've talked to about this um, have expressed that they'll use it as a differentiator to win business with their seller and we'll pass that fee share onto them. In doing so, the fee share can offset their listing fee and lighten the overall load on the deal. Ultimately, it's your choice, but it's a great way to earn more fees as you leverage the platform. We have four tiers, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, ranging from 10 to 40% fee share. 
It's not an annual program. And as you continue to close more deals on the platform, you progress to the next tier. There's, there really is a huge commitment to the brokerage community from the board all the way down to, to scale our company 10X to and you know, with and through the brokerage community. And this program has just been announced this week. So we look forward to continuing the partnership and working with you all. Thank you, Ian and Jim. We appreciate 10X's continued support of CCIM Institute. I'm thrilled to welcome everyone today to CCIM Institute's economic update with Chief Economist Casey Conway. Thanks for joining me, Casey. Thanks, Eddie. And I brought along my friend, the Red Shoe Economist, if that's okay. <laughs> so I want to uh, thank you know start by thanking uh, you, Eddie, for uh, this this opportunity, and also thank the CCIM and the leadership during periods of disruption. Most of you can remember, or maybe you can remember back to just 2018 and 19 when we had the Accelerant Insight to do business disruption and Dave uh, Dave Wilson and, and um, Barbara Crane got us through that. Now Eddie, uh, you and Greg Fine and the team are getting us through COVID disruption. So this is this is where we get the value of our of our um, of our dues and our membership. So thank you very much. So Eddie, I think the best way to start off an economic outlook is always with some historic perspective. And I'm gonna go way, way back, be way beyond 2009 to how about Winston Churchill? And I think this is an appropriate quote as we're talking about the economy and forecasting what's gonna happen. So this was a, a quote that Winston Churchill gave at a eulogy, believe it or not, in 1940. And it's on the screen there. It is not given to human beings happily for them for otherwise life would be intolerable to foresee or predict to any large extent the unfolding course of events. So we're gonna do our best here, um, Betty, um, not to predict the future, but maybe give some great cues and context and perspective on the future. Well, that sounds good, Casey. Before we jump into the predictions, let's take a closer look at the past and present. How does our current climate compare with 2009? Right, so Eddie, I think uh, that's that's a great way to set it up. This, this is not 2009, and I think we need to almost kind of quit the uh, comparisons there. Let me start first. 2009 was a liquidity uh, liquidity crisis where credit froze up or it got contracted. The banks withdrew home equity line and business lines of credits. Uh, second, 2009 in the in the financial crisis really took years to play out what we've seen play out here in a matter of months. Uh, so if you think about it, the whole financial crisis started in the first half of 2006. Uh, we had home builder stocks drop 50% in that first, first half. We saw the housing crisis really develop out of Florida after the 2004 and five hurricanes wiped out any ability to get property and casualty insurance. Um, and so it, it, it proceeded all the way forward really through 2010 with Lehman and AIG and all those things. And so it took really, you know, 2007 through 2010 to wipe out 40% of the market and of CRE values. We've almost kind of done some of that and that type of damage in literally just three or four uh, of four months. Third, the Fed was slow to act in 2009. I was there, I had a front row seat. Uh, it was slow to lower rates. It was slow to develop intervention policy and develop the facilities um, that were necessary. So let's look at the COVID difference. So that's kind of a, we go from a liquidity crisis to now we really have a public health crisis as we all know. It's an industry um, kind of employ an employment crisis due to the shelter in place, but the Fed response has been much more responsive. It's a true bottom up rather than a trickle down. Trickle down 2009 was put the money in the banks and hope it all worked its way down. This time it's bottom up um, and the Fed reaction has been much quicker. They quickly went to 0% interest rates. They then thrown everything at this thing while Congress delayed to try to get uh, CARES done. They developed corporate property, um, uh, uh, paper facilities, um, and, and really buying everything down to student loan debts. The, the, they've also been very quick on policy response. Look at the things like the FDIC on loan, loan modification guidance. So uh, hopefully, Eddie, that makes some sense. And we got the screen here to move maybe on to our, our debt situation. So we want to talk about that a little bit. Sure, go right ahead, Casey. <laughs> So up here on the screen, we have the current Congressional Budget Office, and you see, wow, things look pretty good here for the United States, right? We still have positive uh, net, net revenues and expenses are under control. Take a breath. 
um, this does not reflect the CARES intervention, nor does it reflect uh, that uh, uh, taxes have been deferred until July instead of um, our April deadline. So it does not reflect at all our current um, our current fiscal situation at all with much more to come. So that's the latest CBO uh, situation. What we need to focus on is uh, Congress returns April 20th, and we're gonna get to work on a CARES 2 spend bill uh, here. And uh, what we need to pay attention to is the debt situation that we entered going into this COVID situation. We already had 20, a record 23 trillion in debt. We were on track for this first, uh, the first half of fiscal 2020 in the government to have another trillion dollar deficit, which we hadn't experienced since 2009. We were over 100% of our GDP of our debt to GDP ratio, and in the last four to six weeks, we've added five trillion dollars to our debt: 2.3 trillion from CARES and another 2.7 from the Fed. They've ballooned their balance sheet back up from below three a trillion to over five trillion dollars. Keep in mind, the Fed doesn't produce or sell anything. So how does it get money to put its put things on its balance sheet? It calls its friends at Treasury and says, will you please crank up the printing machine? Um, and so even though we quote have a, still a strong dollar, we're, we're really um, undermining the strength of that dollar with our deficit spendings. Um, so to translate that debt, <clears throat> um, we need to also look from the national level to the state level. So some of the chapters and some of you that I was able to visit in January and February, starting in, in Miami and going to uh, Pennsylvania and going down to Texas and through the Carolinas, I was queuing up at the beginning of the year how our debt situation needed to be translated to different states and which states were more fiscally strong versus weak. And so uh, we've got an update to that. The Pew uh, Trust put out a good report in March that showed the, the total balances and reserves that states had to deal with a crisis. So this was early March and uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, stark and what we need to take in mind because I think it's gonna factor in to the politics of CARES too. We have states, there's a real bifurcation between really fiscally strong states and very weak states. So the strongest, anybody there from Wyoming or Oregon or Texas, Wyoming has total reserves to deal with a crisis of 397 days. Um, uh, Oregon has over 100 days, 137. North Dakota, 120. South Carolina, those uh, Carolinians, uh, uh, 77 days. Alabama, 68. Tennessee, Florida, Georgia, all over 40 days. Who's the weakest? Let's start with Pennsylvania. They have total reserves in the rainy day funds of four hours, one third of a day. Uh, next weakest is Illinois, followed by Kentucky. The fiscally weak states going into this virus are gonna need much more financial support. And Congress is gonna be calling in CARES too on those fiscally strong states to step up and maybe disproportionately pay. So that's something we need to pay attention to. I think the other piece is those fiscally strong states will be in a position to stand their economies up quicker than those that are fiscally weak. So it's really important we translate that down, um, down to the, the lowest level. So, um, with that news, uh, I guess, uh, Eddie, any any thoughts, agreement, disagreement on, on that? I'm sitting here looking and we're about 15 minutes into this. And you've already provided the attendees today a, a wealth of information. So why don't we just go ahead and continue? Casey, okay. in the current climate, where is capital coming from now? Very, very good question. So uh, let's let's start with where it's not coming from. <laughs> okay. So it's not it's not coming from CMBS. The CMBS industry is shut down. They can't hedge or price in this kind of a volatile market or at zero percent interest rates and not where they're not knowing where they're going. Um, life companies and, uh, and many institutional funds still are lending, although their under their underwriting is getting tighter. They don't know where this is going to go. So you'll find that LTV and debt service coverages are are getting a little bit. Um, are getting a little bit more strained and tightened in the, situ in the situation. Um, on, on the other end of it, we've got the liquidity. The banks are still open. Unfortunately, the banks are trying to deal with a lot of their customers and loan modifications, putting the PPP money out. So they're a little tame and a little sheepish about taking on a lot of new business in this environment. The GSEs, the government sponsored entities are very, are very involved. Um, and so this slide that we've got up here now, it's a great one that was produced by Real Capital Analytics recently, and it shows who holds the debt by property type. And so we're in pretty good shape, except for one entity that's all orange there. You see the government agencies, Freddie and Fannie, 
they hold 93% of all the multifamily debt in this country. So you wonder why there was intervention first on the multifamily for offering loan forbearance if they gave rent forbearance. But if you look at the other property types, you look at the hotel, which is the kind of the mid shade tan, and you look at the retail, which is a light blue, no one lender source holds more than about 15%. That's very a, different than 2009, where the banks held a majority of all this stuff, or CMBS. And what that means is, if you've got a hotel loan or a retail loan or industrial or office, there's much better chance the lender isn't going to be wiped out by any one of those property types. They're going to have much more ammunition and capital to probably work through the deal, reprice it, do loan workouts. So this is a very, very encouraging item uh, to me, is to see this particular perspective on, on, um, on where the debt is. What do, you, what do you think, Daddy? Feeling good? I, I, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good for the information right now. So, how uh, how are you looking at the at the macro level? What I so mean by it, that is, how, how, what do you ahead. see, or how do you see things playing out over the the next few months, and what metrics should industry professionals be monitoring? Yeah, so let's start with kind of everybody's asking what type of a recession we're going to have. We have different letters we throw around, the V, the W. Um, I think this is coming up on the screen right now. So the V is what we're hoping for. It's a sharp decline with a sharp recovery. This is what we had in 1990 to 91 and 2001. That's what we're all hoping for. The U shape, we don't like that. Take a U turn and we want to get the heck out of this place. This is what we went through 71 to 78, the inflation, the Volcker era, uh, really bad stuff. Uh, the W is where I think we're going to end up here. I think we actually end up with a double dip recession. This is what we had 1980-81. Again, uh, you know, where basically you go down, you begin to recover, but then you realize there's another tentacle or hole that you didn't plug and you have a recession come back. I think that's what we see here. Um, it's basically, uh, as we begin to open up the economy, we'll begin to see some things recover, but as we get a few months into it, I think by fall, we're going to slip back into recession again, as we see that airline travel really didn't recover to the level. Uh, re we lost more small businesses and restaurants and retail than we thought. So the rich economists is the camp. We see a W. The one we don't want to see at all is the L that's Japan. You go down and you never come back. And uh, I've got one other that I hope we don't get. It's called the Q. And the Q is uh, what happens when you have a fiat currency collapse. And the last one we had was in Germany after World War I. Think of the Q, the circle part is the piggy bank. Think is the little uh, leg extension at the bottom of the Q is someone pulls the plug out of the piggy bank and they put a little slide up there and all the money comes out and everything collapses. We hope we don't have a fiat currency collapse either by any part of the world or us ourselves with all of our deficit spending. So the red shoe economist is that we, is that we get a, um, is that we get a W. What do you think, Eddie? Where are you voting? Well, I'm I, I'm definitely voting to stay away from that L for sure, and I like the way you threw in a Q. <laughs> Q for question, right? <laughs> That's right. So, um, with with kind of that background, you think we got any uh, things we should be looking at, or forecasts, or metrics, or things that we should look at? <laughs> Well, I think that you're doing a good job, and I, I know you've got some more information just on that topic by itself, so I'll just let you continue at this point. All right, so let me start with, many of you know I'm a big fan of watching things, forward-looking indicators like the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses, uh, small small index, uh, small business index. Um, you know, let me let me back up just a minute here is before we get into those index we got a slide up here that shows kind of the value implications and this is when i just got off a webinar with the appraisers and the appraisal institute and everybody's trying to figure out with our different property types and our lenders you know how far do things go where do i reprice assets so i did a lot of this at the new york fed in 2009 and 10 in pre-fmc meetings and we looked at what happens to NOI, what happens to cap rate, what's the combination, and how far do we go? And you'll see in that lower right corner, we got to minus 40%. That's what happened in 2009 and 10. Cap rates moved 200 basis points from six to eight. And then we saw NOI destruction in terms of rising vacancies, declining rents. I don't think we go that same way this time. I'm in the camp that we probably some, see something in the range of 20%. It's gonna be less influenced by a rise in cap rate and more in NOI destruction. I think as we as we look at this thing, we're gonna see that rents collapse, that small businesses don't come back. We have much more um, 
costs to deal with and operating and, and sanitization. So I would encourage all property type by property type, market by market, to have this kind of metric matrix in front of you to be thinking in my market, in my property type, where do I stand? And a, you know, a good example we may get to in a few minutes, Eddie, is like multifamily. I have a different view between workforce multifamily and student housing multifamily, where I might think that workforce multifamily might only take a 10 to 15% hit. I might be in the 25, 30% in student housing. So this is a great tool to have in front of you. Real Capitalytics is resurrected and is keeping it kind of updated. But this was like my almost uh, weekly homework at the New York Fed when I was going through that. So with that, we can kind of pivot to what are gonna be some of the metrics. So I started to talk about the NFIB um, metrics, the small business index here. And um, so I follow this a lot because as goes small business, which is two thirds of our economy, goes our economy. And that's why the Fed, I give them kudos this time, they got it right. I give you know, um, the current administration and Congress and the Senate, you get the money into small business. If we can, if we can stay, stead that off, we'll be okay. But here's the here's the bad news. You can see it's already declining. The latest index that was just published shows um, that for the you know for the uh, March period, all of the indicators in the small business optimum in index uh, turned negative. It was uh, one of the biggest declines. There was only one green triangle, as you see on the right side there, and that's inventory. That's not what you want to see unless it's coming into the holiday season where you're building inventory for holiday sales. So we're seeing all the retailers and entities that can't sell inventory. We see all that building up, even at the restaurant levels. Some of our local restaurants are even selling their toilet paper. I'm not kidding you. Um, they're selling their meat because there's nothing to, there's no one to use it in the restaurants and there's not enough takeout. So uh, this is a real important one to watch what happens and see how small business optimism comes back. The parallel to this is the National Association of home builders. And I just posted a piece today from our on our acre website, Alabama Center for Real Estate, on, on the truth and what's happening with the with the new numbers that came out in the NHAB. It was the largest single monthly decline in the indices history. It went from near record territory of 72. Um, it was the first month since the Trump administration that it wasn't in the hundreds uh, range, and it went down to 30. And so it tells you just how bad things are on the housing. And when you add in the latest mortgage application data, it's telling you that it's not because we have an excess in inventory, it's that um, builders are having trouble, what they're telling you in these indices and reports, they're having trouble retaining their own contractors and employees because in a construction loan, you don't you get a small GNA fee, but you don't get enough to make your payrolls. So these are two I watch. And then there's a few that on the transportation side, I think we've got a couple of slides on transportation indices that I look at. So here you'll see um, several that I've got here. American Association of Railroads, here's their site. You know I follow that. Uh, I love to play with the trains when I was a kid, Eddie. Um, so you know, I, I just you, you don't grow out of some things, right? Our, our wives know that we stay kids as as, as boys. Um, they just reported their their worst month ever since they've been keeping data back to 1988. Um, and so. Uh, you know, the thing we want to watch there is we want to look for when that container and rail traffic comes back. When do our ports get ships coming in from China to restock? How do they move it? Um, and we're seeing some interesting things develop there. We'll get to it in industrial. Port Laredo in Texas just overtook LA and Long Beach as the busiest container port in North America because we're seeing more of the trade and things that we need uh, come through Mexico um, rather than uh, there. And I think as the onshoring and more manufacturing, we'll see that accelerate. The American Trucking Association, look at the trucking tonnage index. This will tell us as well what our choke points are there. We're not treating our truckers very well right now. The rest areas on the interstates are closed. They can't do drive-through at truck stops. Uh, so they're not being allowed to come in and order food, use restrooms and showers. When they get to the distribution warehouses, they're not being allowed to get out of their trucks. So we've got some problems on the trucking side. So look at what happens there. Uh, I also follow the Cass Freight Index pretty closely. Um, you know, looking at look at the inventory to sales ratio. We saw in 2009 that spike pretty much up. I don't know if we have one more slide here, but the other one that I've talked to some of you about is the um, uh, TSA uh, passenger throughput. So for those in the hotel, travel, uh, retail, tourism markets, uh, TSA has a passenger throughput count index that they uh, publish. And going into March, we were still moving about 2.3 million passengers a day through TSA at all of our airports. Yesterday's number was a mere 85,000 and change. If we don't see that number quickly move back to a million, million and a half, close to 2 million 
Um, we may end up nationalizing our airline industries. And for many of us, we need to be paying attention to what happens to airline routes. The airlines are probably going to consolidate routes and maybe not and, and lose some permanently. So in our secondary and tertiary markets that you know finally had good flight service with Southwest and Delta and, and American and everybody, we may see key markets uh, lose those route structures and that could have a huge impact on, on our economy and information. So uh, is it time to get rid of the indigestion and have a, a Smith's Family Diner giant biscuit and a glass of tea, Eddie? <laughs> yeah. Next time in North Carolina, we'll definitely do just that. So question for you, do you have any last thoughts on a recession timeline? Yeah, I do. So everybody wants it to be a V. Uh, everybody's hearing, you know, the last 24 hours that we're gonna start to open up the states uh, here um, May 1st. I think it's going to be very gradual. It's going to take longer than we thought. Um, it's going to be, we're going to have rolling shelters in place where hotspots develop. Uh, I think it's going to be very gradual. And I, like a piece I wrote this morning, I think the spring home selling season is going to be one that just doesn't bloom this year. It's going to be next year. So I really think we've got to look up and forward to spring 2021 and figure out what, what if thinking and strategies do I need to do to bridge there? I think we have a lot of work to done, do. I think there's a lot of holes in the dam that haven't been plugged. One important one for us in our industry is in the CRE finance side, the mortgage servicers. So with all this forbearance stuff, that's great for you know, the tenants or the landlords or um, you know, multifamily rent people, that's great that they get forbearance, but guess what? Mortgage servicers still have an obligation to provide the payments, even though they're not getting them, back to the bondholders. And their lines of credits are, are all drawn on by the banks. Uh, they're, real, they're in real serious um, trouble. Uh, Congress doesn't want to bail it out right now. There's no appetite for that to go back and do something that's in the banking or real estate finance arena. If we don't do that, and we, we could have massive destruction in the real estate finance arena. So from an industry standpoint, just like we spoke up really well and really strong for uh, 1031 exchange extensions, which wasn't on the radar, we really need to help the public and our elected officials understand the importance of mortgage servicers and the help that they need. There's a lot of holes in this dam that we're not gonna get plugged. So my thing is a W recession, double dip. We really don't get fully standed up on our feet until next spring or first quarter of next year. All right, well, I appreciate that additional insight on the recession timeline and uh, all the other information you've been providing us so far during the session. So just moving on, let's take a closer look at property types. Hospitality and retail were the first sectors to be affected, and that story has been well covered. But what does retail look like on the other side of this downturn? So great question. We have a great graphic up here. It's one of my favorites. Um, uh, this was, I think, in Visual Capitalist um, that I like. And what it shows is how our consuming behavior has changed during this period. And we have to ask ourselves, does it stay this way or are there any permanent uh, markers here or clues to us? So I don't think we continue to buy disposable gloves at a 700% increase, which is the number one selling item. But I find it interesting that we're buying a lot of bread, mach bread machines. And I find it more interesting if you go about midway in that graphic on the green, look at weights and look at uh, fitness goods. And what, and what you'll find is that those are going up quite a bit. So as we shelter in place at home, I know like with my wife, She's doing um, Zoom Zumba. <laughs> and so we've ordered equipment for her. We've cleaned out one of the kids' rooms that went off to college um, and uh, converted that to a, you know kind of a personal gym. Does she go back to a gym or go back to Zoom at a retail center? I'm kind of doubting not. I think there's some changes. If you look at who's lost the most, look at luggage, briefcases, menswear, any kind of, you know, bridal wear. I guess we've given up on getting married. We've been sheltered in place too long. We don't want to, we don't want to, you know, uh, be together anymore. Um, you know, we can't go to the beaches. We can't do any of the summer activities. So swimwear, men's and women's wear, we're not going anywhere. We found all of our comfortable stretchy pants and our, our, um, our, our flip-flops. I've been looking for uh, red shoe flip-flops, but haven't been able to find those that I want. So what I think it means is a couple of things for retail. I'm real concerned that the trend towards experiential retail may have taken a real hit. Are we really gonna want to gather in big places in the urban cities 
uh, to do that type of stuff. And I think some elements of experiential retail are going to be completely rethought. The other thing I think it means is that when we regather in retail, we're going to want more space. We're not going to have the same densities. So what that means is the retail entity might, uh, let's say a restaurant, might want more square footage to space the tables out and the chairs and everything out. Well, the restaurant says, that's fine. I need more space, but I can't pay you any more rent. <laughs> I'm still making the same revenue if it all comes back. So I think it means we may have a repricing that goes on in both rent per square foot and in valuation. So I think that's one thing to be thinking about. I think the other one is to distinguish between consumer staples and consumer discretionary. The consumer's balance sheet has been hit pretty hard here, and I don't think we fully appreciate that yet. So the consumer is going to have a lot less to spend on discretionary items and is going to continue to spend more on those um, on those staples. So things like grocery stores, Walmart, Costco, uh, food, you know, buying a bread machine to make bread at home. I think those things um, I think are going to be stronger rather than weaker. And we may see a flip flop from that everything going experiential till we go back to more con uh, consumer staple. I also think it means that the retail that was commanding the highest rents in the urban areas where everybody was congregating and doing density um, in terms of residing and activity, that could reverse out. And just like in the 1950s, we may all go back to the suburbs and suburban retail may actually get rejuvenated here. I don't know the answer, but I think a graphic like this is one that helps us getting to think that. One other point before we leave this one, I was going back to some of my boxes and, and research and materials that I saved from my time at the at the New York Fed and, and the, the Fed in 2005 to 10. And I was reading in one of the business journal articles, this is the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And uh, the date on, on this one was uh, June 4th, 2009. And the headline was big retail chain seeking rent cuts from landlords. Wow, deja vu, right, Eddie? Everything comes back. Yeah. Um, the other one is I looked at two re real estate research, RERC reports uh, from, from summer of 2009 uh, in the fall. The summer of 2009, the heading was courage, conviction, decisiveness. Kind of sound like what we need to have now, courage, conviction, and decisiveness. And by the, the fall to winter 2010, the, the headline in their report was it just, it just takes pure determination. So I thought those were kind of um, predictive a little bit and telling about retail. So we want to, what do you think about retail? Hospitality, I can talk a little bit about. I think hospitality is really tough because I, I used to travel 70 trips a year. I was in, you know, January, and February, I did 20 trips uh, through the Atlanta airport. You think I had any chance of not getting the COVID virus? <laughs> um, I, I was begging that, come on, dude, come on, try to get me. <laughs> I am not real eager to get back on an airplane. I'm not real eager to go back through the Atlanta airport. And from the hospitality standpoint, that means I'm probably also not going to be spending as much time. Uh, our hotel, we're going to have to rethink. We'll talk a little bit about adaptive reuse and why I think that's going to come into play. We could see cruise ships, uh, you know, have to become multifamily. Um, but I, I think we have a, a, a lot of rethinking to do there. You want to... Talk about any of the other property types or stick yeah. with retail? Or? That's really good insight on the retail front and uh, being a retail specialist here in Charlotte. I, I understand that and I really appreciate your insight. But there's others on this call that would love to know about how the other big property sectors are doing. How will those sectors be impacted? Why don't we start with industrial? Oh, yeah. So start with the easy one, right? So all the all the industrial guys can go get in line for cocktails first. So just like after 2009, we had a thing happen in CMBS and C in CRE Finance called uh, CMBS 2.0. We had to reinvent it after it collapsed and, and respond to what had happened. I think we get logistics 2.0 after this. Logistics aren't going to be the same. Industrial aren't going to be the same. One of my theories is that we're going to build fewer of the big 1 million square foot e-commerce distribution centers. And if you want to see the future of industrial, I think walk down the cereal aisle where it's safe to do that at your neighborhood grocery store and look at the packaging varieties. I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see more two, 300,000 square foot, less than 500,000 square foot distribution centers. So if something goes wrong, we don't have huge, massive supply chain distri distribution or disruption. We're going to do away, I think, largely with just-in-time uh, inventory management, which means we're going to have just-in-case management replace just-in-time. We're going to have more redundancy in the system. 
I think we're also gonna see like the Port Laredo thing that I made reference to where our largest container ports shift and that LA and Long Beach become less, less important and less uh, in the volume and that we trade off to maybe like a Laredo or ports in Florida or along the East Coast, like at the Port of Charleston or Savannah um, or, you know, those locations. And I think that's because our trade patterns are going to change differently. We're not going to manufacture everything in China. So the logistics infrastructure stuff is going to change pretty dramatically here. Um, I think we're also going to see that the industrial assets actually could lose value here. So I'm on a board with a public REIT. And we're seeing deals, same deals, same tenants, brand new industrial logistics facilities that were offered and we were competing for in the five cap rate range at the beginning of the year, now being offered us at six or as high as seven as institutional funds have backed out of deals. They've walked from deposits because they have to rebalance their portfolios. And so the developer, the merchant developer knows he's got to move that asset on. So he takes that forfeited deposit, reduces the price, and now we're able to buy at a much higher cap rate. So I think the one area where cap rate's going to change and benefit buyers of industrial uh, is going to be um, industrial on the cap rate side. So I think we have a ways to go on industrial. It's going to be very interesting to see how it evolves. I think it's uh, it's not the total safe haven. There's some things to, to pay attention to there. Does that, does that help on industrial? It does. Um, so what advice do you have for the, the commercial real estate professionals um, in this sector? Oh, geez. <laughs> you there? <laughs> right. Uh, uh, go beyond industrial and say we look at, at office, for example. I think we have to we have to look at, um, you know, at the at the office situation and uh, how that might change. So I actually am going to go contrarian to the thinking out there that we're all going to love having Zoom and working from home. I know that personally, I'm ready to move on to um, on, on, on to being able to go back to an office or to campus uh, where we have an office, be, just to get some distance and be able to have a quiet conversation and a meeting and in social interaction. So I think we could see a huge surge in um, in office activity and leasing after this. But here's the thing, just like retail and industrial, I think we're gonna see spacing out that the office using tenants, the density ratio that we got used to going from 300, one, one per worker per 300 down to 150 to 180, I think we could see that reverse back up and the office tenants say, I want more distancing. I want a third of the cubicles gone. I want half of the restroom fixtures removed so there's more distancing, but I'm not paying you any more rent. I think the creative office trend where everything's open in architecture, um, that, that could revert and change. So I think we need to be doing the what if thinking around that. My biggest piece of advice is don't assume we're going back to norms. Do the what if thinking about what, what does this mean? Think outside of the box. Um, how does, you know, things like does experiential retail continue? Does office stay at the same density? On the office, we may see that we again revert back from an urban model back to the suburbs where we're closer to home. So in order, maybe we don't want the Zoom as much at home, but we want to be closer to home without the commuting with more, more space options on there. So those are those are two. Um, you want to chat at all about multifamily or any of the other property types? Yeah, since we covered the rest of them, why don't we finish up with uh, multifamily? What do you see there? So multifamily, I have a, a, a couple of uh, heartburn things that I may need to take a Smith Family Diner from, uh, you know, Biscuit from uh, Greensboro, North Carolina with a big, big gulp of iced tea. <laughs> um, the first is I think we need to distinguish between workforce multifamily and student housing multifamily. I think the workforce will come through okay. The GSEs are giving lots of support. They're supporting the tenants with rent uh, forbearance as long as uh, the landlords are um, are giving it. They'll give them um, mortgage forbearance. Um, but the student housing is a different story. Um, the universities didn't get factored into the CARES bill. Uh, we could lose 25 to 30 percent of our universities and colleges as a result of this. The acceleration to online earning is going to be just like the acceleration we're seeing in online grocery. Everything's been accelerated by, by years. And these college towns, I think, are going to be very strained. Do the students come back? Do they go to online earning? learning. What do we do with the off-campus uh, housing and even the on-campus? So I have two daughters, uh, you know, graduate school and undergrad, and in both their situations, their leases uh, had an act of God and active university clause, where in the off-campus private 
market housing, we were able to cancel that lease at the end of March and not have to pay the rent all the way through August. We haven't begun to factor those things in. So that's one, distinguish between workforce multifamily and student housing. Number two, and for CCIMs, this is where your talent can shine. A lot of the marketability skills, the, the um, investment management skills that you have are gonna be desperately needed by these um, private investment entities on student housing. The next one is rethink the urban versus suburban model. Are we really gonna see everybody wanna go back to the city in high density or are they gonna be more comfortable in the suburbs? So I think an opportunity here could be a lot of the suburban multifamily that was value add or maybe had higher vacancy could come back into very favorable, favor, very favorable play. The other one on the multifamily is I think we're gonna to have to do a lot of what if thinking around senior housing. And so, you know, are seniors gonna to wanna to stay in a senior housing setting or nursing or assisted living when we see the horrific stories about the number of seniors that have died in nursing homes, uh, when we see their isolation that's resulted where they couldn't have visits from family and whatnot and could only you know, do Zoom type calls. Um, the other thing is the families that have been supporting mom, grandma and grandpa in those facilities, their balance sheet's taken a hit. And are they really gonna have the resources to fork out four five, six thousand dollars $6,000 a month to keep grandma and grandpa in that facility versus bring them back home after this? So I think a lot of what if thinking is gonna happen around senior housing. Got you, got you have indigestion yet, Eddie? Yeah, well, it's it's okay. So let me ask you a question here. Anything that they can be doing now to either to navigate the current environment or to prepare themselves for the market when multifamily does come out of this? So one of the big ones, and I credit CCIM with the foundation, providing the foundation on this. Um, the leadership created this insight series that we've been doing in partnership at the University of Alabama with them. Think of some of the papers that we've written and published. We've given you the foundation tools. Number one, the first one we did was on adaptive reuse. And so, you know, the, the whole adaptive reuse paper, that is going to be the most important skill set that we can give and, and have as CCIMs because everything we're looking at, whether it's what to do with a hotel, where there's not demand, what do we do with urban office that's maybe less in demand than suburban? What do we do with retail when and the numbers I saw today is um, that somewhere but that somewhere they're going to see that only 40% of the restaurants survive this thing. Um, so what do we do with all of that space? I know, Eddie, you work a lot with that. How do we, what do we repurpose it with? Do they maybe become telemedicine type places? So the adaptive reuse skill, that paper that we've done is going to be very important. I think our government, local government communities are going to realize that the, uh, that the obstacles they used to present for adaptive reuse and making it go slow and not make a decision are going to become accelerated. Um, so take that paper, share it with your local government officials. Um, you know, we, I know we did it in Tucson in a big way. Uh, we've done it in some other markets, uh, Denver and, um, and other places, Nashville. And I think they're going to accelerate and take down some of the barriers so that we can more quickly put assets back to use. We may see telemedicine go into closed branch banks. What are we going to do with all of these out parcels uh, that have buildings on it? That could be a variety of different things. So I think adaptive reuse is one. I think that would be probably the most important skill as a CCIM. I would make sure I come out of this thing as just an absolute expert on uh, at the University of Alabama, we keep probably the largest database in the country on this. Uh, we do on adaptive reuse what CoStar doesn't. We cover about 40 states. We cover the projects. We collect the financial statements. We know what the IRRs and performance metrics are. If we can help you, we're probably going to do an update paper with CCIM on that um, in the near future. The second one I'd say is retail evolution. Remember, we published that uh, last fall, Eddie, at your um, as you ascended into your role in San Diego, and really. You know, I've seen the pieces come back out that want to describe retail as apocalyptic again. Look, at it's just evolving. And everything we were seeing and that we cited in that paper, the movement to online grocery, um, you know, all, all of this stuff being accelerated, that how do we keep moving from a, a shop and take home economy to, a, a, you know, deliver in order to me just in time. All of that has been accelerated, whether it's retail, whether it's auto, and now telemedicine. So, um, I'd go back and reread that again. Um, put your hat on for your clients and all. It's retail evolution. What do we do? How do we come out of this? What happens to experiential retail? Does suburban retail do stronger than urban retail? So those would be the two pieces of advice I'd give you. And I, and I really compliment the CCIM Institute for having the insights <laughs> to create that insight series. I think we've done some good research and paperwork there. 
Well, I know that you and the Alabama Center for Real Estate are definitely the go-to experts on adaptive reuse, uh, tracking the 40-plus projects that you spoke about. Um, I know you, you did write a widely covered report on it for the CCIM Institute back in 2018. And so, in, in your opinion, can you further elaborate, is now definitely the time to reconsider adaptive reuse? And if you were to write that or rewrite that report today in a post-coronavirus world, what does adaptive reuse 2.0 look like in your opinion? No, great, great question, Eddie. You know, I, I, I would and I do want to rewrite that paper because I think like one point is going to be that it's more applicable to more property types than before. You know, historically, it's been more of kind of the historic use or the, you know, forgotten urban stuff that now we could fill up with high density urban. I think now the adaptive reuse equation extends to the suburbs and there's opportunities that are gonna be there. It extends beyond just retail. It's really gonna accelerate into hotel. So I would be cross pollinating in the adaptive reuse area with my CCM colleagues that have skill set in those property types that are gonna be distressed because that's where they're gonna need the most adaptive reuse help. So you can't generalize everything in adaptive reuse, but adaptive reusing a hotel property to something else like housing, uh, you know, or, you know, or a hospital is, is an entirely different thing. And you need the entities that have that hotel expertise to know how to maybe unwind the, uh, the flag or operating agreement that you have. Uh, in the retail, there may be co-tenancy clauses that have to be unwound in the retail center to uh, adaptively reuse the thing. You may not have all the easements. The skill sets that CCIMs have that you've studied in all your coursework are not only just you know the basics of the real estate, but the financial, the market analysis. Th this is where it's, it's really gonna shine. So that would be one. The other one is, I would really look to now why we're in disarray and local governments in your communities are trying to figure out what am I going to do as I see restaurants close and retail close and small businesses close. Remind them there's a path forward. It's called adaptive reuse. Remind them that CCIM is led on this. Remind them about your skill set in this and be able to talk the language and help them ma map out a new adaptive reuse zoning ordinance in their own community where you can be of a lot of value. I think that's going to be critical in, in secondary markets to get hit with maybe loss of airline routes or that are college towns that have a lot of um, destruction there. So um, I think those are a couple of areas that I'd look at. Well, that's great. And for those that don't know the term, I know that KC and others utilize the term ADRU when we're talking about adaptive reuse. So if you hear that, that's exactly what he's talking about. Yeah, and, and ADRU is not an Atlas Shrug character. It uh, it actually is <laughs> just the <laughs> acronym for adaptive reuse, not, not something in Atlas Shrug, right? <laughs> there you go. Well, so KC, here's a good question for you. U.S. debt is at record levels and will go even higher given the pandemic relief programs. What are your insights into how that will play into the future for interest rates, global competitiveness, inflation, and et cetera? So really, really good question, however that came in. Um, so uh, we forget that inflation can come from two sources. The one we fixate on with the consumer price index is what's happening with pricing. So we have oil today below down to $17 a barrel. It's where it was when I was in college. Um, you, it's, it means we can buy gas below a dollar a gallon. So we have no energy inflation. We're seeing lumber prices drop by 25%, which is kind of puzzling to me because home builders are still building homes. They have construction loans. We really haven't seen any of that stop. I've gotten my car and driven around my community and every construction and housing projects is full bore ahead. Um, so on the commodity prices and asset prices, we, we, we tend to focus, well, if those are going down, there's no inflation. There's another component of inflation. And it came about um, in the 1970s where Paul Volcker shut down the, the economy and took us to 21% interest rates. And we've seen it in places like Germany after World War I. It's when your currency is so devalued, when nobody believes it has value, when they realize you've just been printing money and you call the treasury and say, print this stuff, um, that uh, you know we, we call it fiat currencies because there's nothing backing it. And when the rest of the world discovers it really has no value or backing, uh, it, you know, it can collapse. And so as you devalue your currency with massive amounts of debt, we can see inflation develop. We've seen it in Brazil, parts of Latin America before, um, and we're not immune from it. There's a great piece um, that I'd recommend by a gentleman um, by the name of John Lifflander, L-I-F-F-L-A-N-D-E-R. If you Google John um, uh, John Lifflander, Lifflander, uh, jlifflander.com, 
he's got a piece that he wrote over a decade ago that I it scared the dickens out of me, but I, I, I follow it a lot. It's called, the title is uh, How Monetary Policy Impacts CRE Values. And what it really is, is a chronology of fiat currencies that have collapsed. It starts with the Roman Empire when Nero took silver out of denarius. It goes on to uh, China in the Song Dynasty when they quit supporting their currency with silver, I mean, um, uh, silk backing it. And then Germany in World War, after the end of World War I, um, where they they completely, um, the currency went to like some something one, uh, you know, four trillion dollar, four trillion uh, the, the German marks to uh, to one dollar or something it was ridiculous. I think we need to know that inflation can come from us being a fiat currency that just prints and goes massively into debt. That's the risk I have, and I think it also means although states can't file bankruptcy, we could see that concept challenged in places like Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Kentucky. Um, you know, when you think of Pennsylvania only having total reserves and rainy day funds for four hours, Illinois less than five days, uh, Kentucky less than 10 days, you know, these are really scary concepts that can cause massive amounts of inflation when, you're, when your currency or your economy is worthless. Thank you, Casey. Ready for some Tums now instead of the biscuit? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I have a, a, one more question for you here. How do appraisers using past lease sell comps appraise in the current market when so many sectors of the commercial real estate market have been severely impacted and those leases and sales are no longer relevant? Yeah, we just spent two hours on a nationwide appraisal institute webinar on that topic with uh, really good people from all sectors, property types, and um, and sources talking about that. So here's a concept, a key concept that came out of the regulatory world. It's in, it is called the interagency appraisal guidelines that were created from FIREA back in 1989 and 1991 that after the SNL crisis, and it's called valuation during a period of material change. And so you can't just speculate and say, well, we're just going to drop values 20% or 40%. You've got to look at forward-looking um, market conditioned indicators, like I shared, the NFIB or the real time indicators or TSA uh, passenger throughput to help you understand, you know, is it short term? Is it long term? And when I was early in my career at uh, the former equitable real estate, I got assigned as a young guy from Colorado um, that they could throw under the bus to go be the portfolio manager of all of the investments in the equitable account for um, all the Texas and Colorado markets where the oil patch had, had just com completely exploded. And we, we said, look, you know, this brand new office building that one of the oil companies um, that, you know, Mobile or Chevron had occupied in downtown Denver, that we spent a couple, three, today would be three, four hundred dollars a square foot to build. It can't be worth nothing. We had no demand for leases. The building was 100 percent empty. It was a brand new office building. So we ended up holding an auction in the market. Uh, I think back that time it was Cushman and Wakefield held it for all of the Equitable's office space leases. And we sublet all the stuff for pennies a square foot over the expense stop. So entities came in and assumed, you know, it was left on a 20 or 30 year lease at, you know, say the expense stop then was five bucks a square foot and they might bid a dime over it. So for $5 and 10 cents a square foot for the next 20 years, that was the office rent. And until that burned off in Denver, the downtown market never recovered. You know, they got back to recently $40 a square foot rents. So we created what was known as a market correction factor in discounted cash flows. So we said, we're pretty smart guys at Equitable. We think that this problem in Denver is only gonna last two years. We'll model it in the DCF down for two years and then we'll mark this sharp V recovery and, and get back to our value within three to five and, and not take as dramatic a decline in value. Well, two years came by, darn, we were wrong. <laughs> it, we had another two years. So it was, it was essentially a four year. It ended up being a seven to eight year market correction factor. But one tool I would encourage CCIMs to think about to help their clients. I don't think we're looking at those periods here. Those would be depressionistic, um, not recessionistic in orientation but help clients and their lenders um, and investors think about more of a market correction. So if you think this is a six month or a one year or a two year disruption, model that in, look at demand and, and normalizing rents and, and, and whatnot come back one or two years later and redo the cash flow. The CCIM's cash flow skills 
are ideal for this kind of help. And many of our investors, not all of them are big pension funds. A lot of them are, are, are less sophisticated or smaller investors or investment funds. And your skills that you have today are badly, badly needed by, by the market to help understand that. Well, thank you, KC. We have about five minutes left here on our webinar today. And before we wrap up, do you have one last piece of advice for CCIMs and also the other commercial real estate professionals who are out there working the problems? That's a dangerous question, you know, Eddie, for, for me, I don't ever have just one of anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll give you a, one bundle of, of like five key points. So here, the, here would be the five key points that I take away and I'm gonna give so that the Dean at the university and, and Grayson Glaze running our center and an adjunct professor don't get mad at me. I always have to give a reading recommendation. So here are my five quick points. Um, I think we need to think about a W-shaped double dip recession. Um, and that this is going to be gradual and more hard to get through and that whatever we get through is a restart this summer, we're going to slip back in the fall and we really need to look forward, uh, look up and forward to spring uh, 2021 uh, if we don't have a re-outbreak and, and, and re-spread uh, re of this thing. Number two, just like we had CMBS 2.0. I think we're going to have logistics 2.0. What we've thought about in industrial and logistics and ports and supply chain and intermodal, it's all going to change. Um, I'll probably work hard with our Acre team to update our logistics infrastructure paper to explain that and why places like Port Laredo are going to be different. And, and honestly, Florida, it's got more ports and harbors than any, anybody else. Port of Mobile, we've just completed an, a terminal expansion there. We have a big entity there called Airbus. And um, you know what, as goes Boeing may go Airbus, at least Boeing's a US company. I'm worried about you know, who's gonna bail out Airbus. The Europeans and, and the French aren't that strong to, to bail them out. So what, what happens on, on demand destruction there? Number three is retail evolution will accelerate. Um, and really it's gonna accelerate tandem with adaptive reuse. My fourth point, adaptive reuse will become your most important skill set to fine tune during this period. Uh, get up each day and think about what can I learn different or new? Maybe we do an updated adaptive reuse um, for CCI members here. And number five, what we're going what we're going through is going to be tougher to get through than we can even imagine. Um, this isn't as easy as opening up the economy. A lot of destruction has been done. Um, and you think about it that you know only 40% of the restaurants may open and survive. When you think about on our appraisal institute call, the forecasts were that 25 to 30% of the hotels may not make it. When you think about small businesses, we've already had 25% um, essentially go out of business and we just don't have it in the data yet. Um, there's some big challenges here and the CCM skill sets are gonna be, are gonna be uh, very much needed. So what I would say is what I've said from day one here is look up and forward. It's the only way you're gonna see it the light at the end of the tum tunnel, but I will give you one warning uh, on the look up and forward. Not all lights at the end of the tunnel are the exit in fresh air. Sometimes it's just another freight train coming down the track. That's my why I think we see a W um, dip, double dip recession. Number two, engage every single day with yourself, with your clients and with your skill sets in what if thinking. If what you've been doing is all retail leasing, what if that doesn't come back? What do my skills translate to? What if I tried adaptive reuse? What if I tried another property type? In the major brokerages that I'm talking to the executives on, all the major ones I can name, they're basically redeploying retail brokers and whatnot that are 1099 and they're putting them to work on food service, logistics, cold storage, where there's just phenomenal demand. They're saying, you've got the basic skills, we'll just orient you to another property type. The third thing I'd say there is, you know, everything we do, and I applaud the Institute on this and many examples, really be greatest generation like in all of our behavior. I am thoroughly impressed with what our business communities, what our business leaders, what our industry leaders like the Institute and NAR, um, Appraisal Institute, IRAM have all done in terms of not wasting time, really being greatest generation, being generous. Um, I wish we could spread more of that um, to Washington, D.C., especially as Congress comes back. But I'm very impressed. Corporate corporate business, the corporate behavior has been very good on all that side. So my last reading recommendation, it's a CCIM. So Jim Baker wrote a good book. Um, I've, I actually wrote the foreword for it. It's called Confessions of a Commercial Real Estate Broker. And it's a great layout. It's almost a, you know, he went through every day of the year and he reflected on the kind of the most meaningful things that happened over his career on that date and gave, gave perspective. Today, April 17th in his, in his book, 
it is called getting up early. The importance of getting up early, the early bird gets the worm, you know, thinking, thinking things um, uh, through. Uh, the other thing is he always gives you perspective on what, what kind of national day the, of, of the year it is. And today is national cheese ball day. So let's all go have a cocktail. Let's go all have some cheese balls, look up and forward, do what if thinking and in all your behavior be greatest generation light. Well, Casey, I'd like to say thanks again to CCIM Institute Chief Economist Casey Conway and 10X for bringing this invaluable content to you today. This recording will be available at www.ccim.com forward slash COVID-19, that's C-O-V-I-D-1-9, and that'll be available later today. We're adding resources to that page regularly to help you to weather the storm. Please do check it out. And thanks to everyone who joined us. As I always end everything these days, stay safe and healthy out there. Thank you and have a great day.